he's truly a Renaissance man, and his work has really touched on each one of these topics in one form or another. Um, I'm going to give short shrift to his bio and a, a very impressive and lengthy bio. Um, I'm certainly not going to do it to justice because everything that he's done um, really just sort of like speaks volumes about his character and the kind of person that he is. But here's uh, here are some of the highlights. Um, he co-founded with his wife Louise um, schools for um, abused and, and learning disabled children. Um, he is also both here and abroad. Uh, set up hospitals, residential treatment programs, schools, and famine relief programs. Um, he's uh, the number one, the most popular uh, progressive talk radio show host today, and I'm sure many of you listen to his program. Um, and there we go, see? <laughs> and he's the best-selling author of He's the best-selling author of 20 books um, in print in over a dozen languages, making him a best-selling New York Times author and the four-time Project Censored Award winner. Um, you know, as I mentioned today, he's here to talk about unequal protection. Um, he wrote this in 2004 rather presciently, um, and it's being reissued again this year. Thoughtful, insightful, and um, hugely readable. Um, it's a wonderful book and just does a really great job of outlining um, the rise of corporations um, from the founding of this country to um, uh, its current state. Uh, he has shown that um, over, the, over the years, um, corp corporations have really um, uh, caused a lot of damage um, ecologically, economically, politically, um, all because they've been given unfettered discretion um, in this legal fiction of personhood. Um, and we've seen this most recently, too, um, uh, the, the damage that can be done um, in the political realm when corporations have too much power, too much influence, too much money. Um, this, uh, just a couple of months ago, as many of you, I'm sure, know, um, the Supreme Court issued in um, uh, Citizens United versus FEC a decision undoing decades' worth of American jurisp jurisprudence and congressional acts um, stating now that um, you know, it's okay for corporations to uh, use um, at, at no limitation funds from their general treasury to uh, electioneer in the few weeks right before a campaign, um, and the few weeks right before an election, the time when most Americans really start paying attention to what's going on in politics. Um, naturally, this is going to have huge ramifications for American democracy, um, and uh, here to tell us all about it and tell us what we can do and how we can undo the damage of that, de that decision is Mr. Tom Hartman. I want to share with you the arc of, in American history, and what has, to a large extent, as a consequence of American history, become world history, the role of corporations uh, in, in political life and, and really in all of our lives in, in, in so many ways. And uh, first, let's begin at the beginning. Originally, you know, at least for the last 7,000 years up until about 300 years ago, with the singular exception of the 300 or so year experiment of, of uh, Athens, of, of uh, Grecian uh, democracy. Other than that, the three dominant forms of government, governance in the world had been uh, people who were ruled by warlords, kings who just seized power and said, you know, I'm, I'm in charge because I'm the biggest guy and, you know, whatever. And that, that, that became hereditary in very many cases. The second was people who, who claimed that God had informed them how things should be or, a, or the gods or uh, variations on gods or whatever, the theocracies. Kingdoms or theocracies. And uh, the third were kingdoms that were informed by theocracies, kingdoms that claimed theocratic rights. I mean, to this day, the coins of England uh, or the United Kingdom have on them a series of letters. I don't remember them right off the top of my head, but uh, something Rex, uh, da, da, da. But basically, what it is is the, the queen rules by the grace of God in Latin. You know, it's the, the letters that stand for that. And, and that, was, that was the the belief, the position, the standing. So for, for thousands, thousands of years, this was the standard. 
And you know, we decided to try something new in this country. And at the time of the founding of the country, there was a lot of debate about how these things should be done and how things should be organized and what should be put together and who should have rights and what those rights should be. Um, it's very interesting. Even I'm, I'm going to talk about the rights of women in a few minutes and, and, and uh, the Iroquois confederacies, the, the, these five uh, later six nations of northeastern New England, uh, New York, mostly New York, New York State and into that area, had for nearly a thousand years been governed by what they called the Great Law, a, conf a constitution. And 34 of their representatives were invited to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 in Philadelphia to first bless the building. They actually smudged the building, and then to to be to be present to to offer their thoughts and advice. They slept there several nights on the second floor, and Ben Franklin introduced them. And when he introduced them, and I'm doing this from memory, but I think I've got it word for word. Um, and, and by the way, his use of this language was not meant in any kind of derogatory fashion. It was meant in a very, very respectful fashion. This is just how, this was just the language of the day. He said, as, as he was introducing them at the opening of the Constitutional Convention, he said, if, uh, if five nations of ignorant savages have been capable of living together in peace for a thousand years, then certainly 13 colonies of educated Englishmen can do the same. <laughs> And, and um, what he knew about them, and what several of the founders, Jefferson wrote about it at some length in some of his diaries and his personal notes, was that the Iroquois had decided that, well, written into their great law, among other things, were three, three essentially three branches of government for all practical purposes, a Supreme Court in particular that, that, uh, that had the ability to, to strike down laws. And that only one, and, and, the, and in the Constitution, it said that every decision made had to be made in the context of its impact on the seventh generation. Now, the Iroquois had figured out after a few centuries that there was one group among them that was more concerned about the seventh generation than another, and that that group was women. And so in five of the six Iroquois nations, only women could vote. And the men were the Sachems, the, the, the men who went and traveled the long distances to convey their, their particular community's concerns to another community and, and did the annual meetings. But they had no decision-making power. They had to go back, and the women would vote, and then, they would, and then the men would go out and communicate this. And you know, so the, the founders of our country, all being men, thought, well, that's kind of a cool idea, only one gender voting. Uh, but you know. <laughs> But uh, to corporations, we'll get back, back around to this and, and the idea. First of all, just a, a quick story of how I got to this. We, my wife and I bought a house in Vermont. And we sold a, a business in 1997 and, and uh, retired, or at least thought we were. And we bought this old house in, in downtown Montpelier, Vermont, that had been built in 1850. And the, uh, there was an old carriage house that was too small because it was literally built for carriages. It was too small to be used as a garage, and so nobody had basically gone into it for probably 50 years. Uh, the, the house was a, a fixer-upper, and and so after we bought the house, I was poking around in the in the upstairs above the carriage house, you know, uh, walking on, on um, not quite logs, but old, you know, the old rough boards that you know, and trying not to fall through the roof and things because there were boxes up there, and I wanted to find out what was in them. What I found were these boxes of books, and they were, I mean, they were, they were damaged by the weather. They, none of them had any uh, resale value. But there was a complete collection, 20 volumes, of the collected works of Thomas Jefferson, which have only been published once in the history of the United States, in 1909 by the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Association and the anniversary of his something or other. I don't know what happened in 1809, but it was, it was a, a centennial edition and it was the last year of his presidency, so maybe that was it, or that was the, the year that Madison took over. But in any case, uh, and, and having a fair amount of time on my hands, I thought, and, and I, I just sat down and started reading. And this was not just his public proclamations and his annual addresses to Congress and all this, this was his personal diaries, his, you know, one of his most fascinating notes that I found in there it was, uh, he was talking to, it was a, a personal note that he made to himself about George Washington. And he said the, the churchmen had come to George Washington 
and had given him a series of written, this is when, he, when Washington was president, and Jefferson was Secretary of State, and had given him a series of questions and, and that would reveal whether or not he was a Christian. And, the, and he said, the old fox was too cunning for them. He managed to answer every question without ever giving a direct answer. <laughs> Interesting. You know, not, not something you're going to find in the Texas school books, but <laughs> there it is. So, so I sat, you know, my, my original goal, I got so wrapped up in this and so into it and so inside Jefferson's head that, you know, about three books into this 20 book set, I just decided I'm going to write a book that is like the story of Thomas Jefferson's America, you know, his ideas of the founding of this country. He was in the Virginia Bur House of Burgesses in, in 1769 or 1770. He was the, one of the, if not the youngest ever elected member of the Virginia legislature. And he proposed a law that would outlaw slavery within 10 years in Virginia. He was a slaveholder. He proposed a law that outlawed slavery. To punish him, his peers in the state of Virginia passed a law to punish him for simply putting this forward. Passed a law that said that if any person in Virginia freed their slaves, those slaves could be immediately captured by the state of Virginia, sold at auction, and uh, oh, and at first would be subject to two years of hard labor. I mean, it was like, there. It, Every, every, every effort he made in any kind of progressive direction, you know, he, he, uh, he's the author of the uh, Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. And in fact, on his tombstone, he specified that he only wanted three things to be on his tombstone. And this was after he was president. He got, uh, in fact, I just yesterday printed out his handwritten note on this, on what he wanted on his tombstone. And he didn't want the fact that he'd been president of the United States, or that he'd been vice president of the United States under John Adams, or that he'd served as our our uh, envoy to France during the time that the Constitution was written, or that he, you know, whatever. He wanted that he was the author of the Declaration of Independence, the author of the, the Virginia, uh, uh, forget the, it's not law, but Virginia something or other of religious freedom, and the founder of the University of Virginia, which was a free school. He believed that every person who was capable of having a good education should be able to get it for free. It was the first free university in the United States. Founded by Jefferson, he was very proud of that. So, one of the things that Jefferson was most concerned about, Jefferson, when, when the Constitution was being put together, the, the, you know, we, had, we had the war against, against the United Kingdom. Uh, by 1881, it was pretty much wound up. Uh, in the, we had the Articles of Confederation, which basically had 13 colonies that were their own independent states, for all practical purposes, that would get together about important matters. And it just wasn't working. The Articles of Confederation weren't working. And so they, they knew that they had to come up with something stronger. And James Madison, who was Jefferson's protege, he's about 20 years younger than Jefferson, as I recall, and, and was, I mean, these guys were like this. You, you read the letters between the two of them, and it was, it was like a father-son relationship. And, and uh, in fact, n another funny point that's kind of off topic, but um, Madison and Jefferson Jefferson, of course, coined the phrase the, the separation of church and state, which is why the Texas uh, School Board took, it, took him out of the textbooks, <laughs> and, uh, literally. And um, in his correspondence with Madison, he, he and Madison are, are talking, now this is before the Constitution was written. He and Madison are talking about, but, but after we're already a country, about how and why it was important to separate church from state. And Jefferson's fear was that some religious fanatic would end up president or the religious crazies would take over a branch of Congress and we'd end up with a theocracy. And Madison wrote back to him saying, oh, you know, you're being hysterical, that'll never happen, people are not that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jefferson, of course, was a deist. He did not consider himself a, quote, Christian. In fact, he took the New Testament, the, four, the first four Gospels, and with a, with a knife, with a razor blade, cut out all of the miracles of Jesus and reassembled it without any miracles in it at all. And that book is still in print. It's one of the few books that's been continuously in print that's an American book from an American author uh, since the 1700s. It's called the Jefferson Bible. You can buy it at Barnes and & Noble. And Jefferson's fear was that, so Jefferson's fear was that the religious crazies would, would take over. Madison's fear was that the government he, the reason he wanted a separation between the two was he was afraid that if the government ever started giving money to churches or influencing them in any way, the churches would become corrupted. 
because Madison considered himself a Christian. I think he was a Presbyterian, as I recall. And, and, uh, and, Je and Jefferson didn't. So Madison, in, fa in fact, Madison's first veto as, as president was vetoing a bill that was passed by the legislature and sent to him as president in, in 1809, it would have been, or eight, maybe 1810, I'm not sure what year it was that he did his first veto, but it was his first veto in office. It was a bill passed by Congress to, uh, to support poor people in Washington, D.C., which Congress had been doing since the, Jefferson, uh, since the Washington administration. Every year they would they would have poor houses and you know for housing and food and, and accommodations and medical care and everything. I mean we, we we started as a welfare state. And the Congress got this bright idea, well let's give the money to the church, uh, to churches and let the churches do this. And that was Madison's first veto. He vetoed that. So it's so ironic. You had Jefferson saying, you know, we can't we can't let the, the religious crazies into government. And Madison saying, oh, that'll never happen. And Madison saying, you know, we can't g have government give, giving money to the to religious folks because uh, you'll corrupt the churches and you'll end up with, you know, billionaire preachers and things. And Jefferson saying, oh, that's crazy. That'll never happen. And they're <laughs> Here we are. You know, it's like they both happened. <laughs> they were both prescient and they were both wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's just incredible. So anyhow, Jefferson, um, uh, Jefferson was in France as the Constitution was being written. Madison spent five years getting ready to write this Constitution. Five years of study, of, of very, very, very intensive study on constitutions. He read the Greek Constitution, the Roman Constitution. He read the Iroquois Confederacy's great law. He, he, I mean, he just, he, this guy was so focused and so obsessed and so careful and so thoughtful. And he was the official scribe of the Constitution. And he kept those, all the notes all through the Constitutional Convention. And he kept them secret, in fact, until, until he died. Uh, which was part of the deal that he made with the other members of the, of the uh, Constitutional Convention. And it turns out, and this isn't in my book, but it's in another book, What Would Jefferson Do? Um, it turns out that the reason he kept them secret is because many of those men in that Constitutional Convention were actually betraying their class. They were creating a society that would work to the benefit of average working people rather than an aristocracy, and they didn't want it known by their, by their peers that that's what they were doing. But in any case, Madison puts together the first draft of the Constitution. And he's, you know, and, and this is like a, you know, a, a summer's work, a half a year's, it's actually several years work in aggregate, but you know, the, the summer of 1787. And he, he mails it to Jefferson with this, you know, long letter about all the work that he's done on this and, you know, what do you think, Dad, kind of letter, you know. And, and Jefferson sends him back a note, and I'll just share a little bit with it. He says, uh, actually, this isn't that note, but it's close. Oh, here it is. Yeah. He said, this is December 20th, 1787. Jefferson wrote to Madison about his concerns. He said, bluntly, it was deficient in several areas. First of all, he starts out, you know, James, you did a wonderful job, and, you know, I know how hard this has been, and, you know, just stroking him and patting him on the head. You know, it's very, very nice, very uh, kind of fatherly. And he says, I will now tell you what I do not like. <laughs> this is a verbatim quote. First, the omission of a Bill of Rights providing clearly and without the aid of sophism for, for freedom of religion, freedom of the press, protection against standing armies. He thought we should not have an army at times of peace at all. He was afraid of the rise of military industrial complex. <laughs> Restriction of monopolies. He did not think that uh, businesses should become so large that they could dominate sectors. And he was also concerned about the copyright laws. Uh, he wanted them uh, uh, shortened. The, the eternal and unremitting force of the habeas corpus laws, which became incorporated in the 5th, 6th, and 7th, and 8th amendments of the Constitution, and trials by jury, you know, 6th and 7th, in all matters of fact, triable by the laws of the land and, and, and not by the laws of nations, end quote. He said, let me add that a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or rest on uh, inference. And then he, wrote a, and, and then, and Madison initially was opposed to this because he took the position which if you read Federalist number 84, you'll find Hamilton taking. In Federalist number 84, Hamilton is arguing very strongly against the Bill of Rights. And Hamilton's point is that if you put a Bill of Rights into the Constitution, future generations may think that the Constitution is conferring rights upon people and that the only rights it's conferring are these 10 that are listed. Whereas, in fact, the Constitution is not conferring rights at all. The Constitution is limiting the power of government. 
the rights are inherent. Human rights are inherent. And, and the, the, the 10 rights in the, in the Bill of Rights are really to, intended to be four examples. And, and so Hamilton thought that this was a dangerous thing. And so did Madison initially. But Jefferson was gung-ho for this. You know, and and the, he, they all had studied the history of England. The, the first Bill of Rights in, in 1638 you know, came out of the, the lawsuit by the four knights over tax. Well, it's a whole long story. Anyway, um, so on February 12, 1788, he writes to Mr. Dumas. He was pushing hard. He's lobbying. This is Jefferson lobbying. He says, with respect to the new government, nine or 10 states will probably have accepted by the end of this month the new constitution. The others may oppose it. Virginia, I think, will be of this number. In other words, this is Jefferson who had control over the Virginia delegation. He was the senior statesman from Virginia. And you know they were not going to vote yes or no unless he said to do, do so, even though he was on another continent. And so here he's issuing this threat. He's going he's to shut down the Constitution. Virginia, I think, will not will be of this number. Beside other objections of less moment, she will, Virginia, will insist on annexing a bill of rights to the Constitution, i.e. a bill wherein the government shall declare that one, religion shall be free, two, print and press is free, three, trials by jury preserved in all cases, four, no monopolies in Congress, in, in, in commerce, excuse me, five, no standing army. Upon receiving this bill of rights, she will probably depart from her objections, Virginia. <laughs> and this bill is so much to the interest of the states that I presume they will offer it unless our Constitution be amended and our union closed by the end of the present year. Um, few, five months later, midsummer of 1788, he's, he's writing, finally, uh, Madison has kind of come around and become an advocate for the Bill of Rights. And uh, Jefferson writes him another letter. He says, I sincerely rejoice at the acceptance of our new Constitution by nine states. It is a good canvas on which some strokes only want retouching. What these are, I think, are sufficiently manifested by the general voice from north, north to south, which calls for a Bill of Rights. It seems pretty generally understood that this should go to juries, habeas corpus, standing armies, printing, religion, and monopolies. So you get it over and over and over again. Jefferson was very clear about what he wanted to be explicit in the Constitution, that, that these were areas where government cannot tread, that, that government or, or, or areas actually where government is is reserving, in some ways, its own powers um, in the case of, of uh, monopolies or not having a standing army. In other words, it's, it's, it's saying these, this is how these things shall be done. So uh, unfortunately, the Second Amendment, if you, uh, in the state, of, the state of Pennsylvania actually had in its constitution at that time in 17, whatever the year was, 1787, I guess it must have been, um, had in its constitution a, an article that said that there would be no standing militia in the state unless during time of war. And it went on to say, in order to uh, provide for a well-ordered militia, uh, the right of an individual citizen to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that entire language was lifted out of the, out of the Pennsylvania constitution in the, in the first draft of the, of the Bill of Rights. And then it got watered down and they did away with the no standing army provision which is an interesting history of the Bill of Rights, but probably not germane to this. But back to corporations and monopolies. From the time, these guys, Jefferson and Madison, they were all very clear. The word, the word corporation should not appear in the Constitution. They did not want that word in there because they did not want anybody to ever think that, well, they just, they wanted the corporations to, to exist at the level of the state where they could be easily controlled. So from the founding of our country, until the 1880s, for over 100 years. Corporations' licenses to do business were revocable by the state legislatures if they exceeded or did not fulfill their chartered purpose. And they frequently were, by the way, corporate death sentence. The state legislatures could revoke a corporation's charter if it misbehaved. The act of incorporation did not relieve corporate management or stockholders and owners of responsibility or liability for corporate acts. As a matter of course, corporate officers, directors, or agents could not break the law and avoid punishment by, claim, by claiming they were just doing their job when committing the crimes, but instead could be held criminally liable for violating the law. State, not federal courts, heard cases where corporations were accused of breaking the law. Directors of corporations were required to come from among the stockholders and be residents of the state. Uh, corporations had to have their headquarters and meetings in the state where the principal business of the, uh, was located. Corporate charters were granted for a specific period of time. It varied from state to state. The longest I could find was, uh, was New York State that allowed 40 years. The rest of them were typically 20 or 30 years. At the end of that time, the corporation had to be dissolved, its assets distributed, 
th there would there would be a tax on those assets. The equivalent this is the equivalent of probate, you know, of, of just you know a person dying there, and and then if they wanted to reincorporate, they could do that to continue the corporation. But there would be an interruption period so that they couldn't amass wealth forever. They didn't want this to be an engine of infinite in terms of time and perhaps in terms of money, uh, wealth accumulation. Corporations were prohibited from owning stock in other corporations in order from, to prevent them from extending their power inappropriately. Corporations' real estate holdings were limited to what was necessary to carry out the purposes of their, of their charter. Corporations were prohibited from making any political contributions direct or indirect. In fact, I'll read a law about that in just a second. Corporations were prohibited from making charitable or civic donations that were outside of their specific purpose of incorporation. State legislatures could set the rates that some monopoly corporations could charge for their products and services. For example, the railroads came later. But and all corporate records and documents had to be open to the legislature and the state attorney general at all times. So, and, and in fact, this is, a, this is a law that was actually on the books of the state of Wisconsin until 1954. Uh, apparently nobody noticed that it was there and when they, when they pulled, finally pulled it off because it hadn't been enforced for uh, at least, at, well, since the 1880s. It's uh, titled Political Contributions by Corporations. No corporation doing business in this state shall pay or contribute or offer consent or agree to pay or contribute directly or indirectly any money, property, free service of its officers or employees or thing of value to any political party, organization, committee, or individual for any political purpose whatsoever or for the purpose of influencing legislation of any kind or to promote or defeat the candidacy of any person for nomination, appointment, or election to any political office. Yeah. Yeah, they were pretty explicit. And then penalty. I mean, this to demonstrate that these guys are serious about this. Now, keep in mind, back in those days, $100 was, you know, several years' salary. It was a lot of money. And $1,000 was a massive amount of money. Any officer, employee, agent, attorney, or other representative of any corporation acting for and behalf of such corporation shall violate this act, shall be convicted upon conviction, shall be punished upon conviction by a fine of not less than 100 nor more than $5,000 and by imprisonment in the state prison for a period of not less than one nor more than five years. <laughs> or by both. <laughs> and, uh, and then they go on to say, uh, da, 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 whereas, it, it, and, and if the corporation shall be subject to a penalty, then by forfeiture in double the amount of any fine, and if a domestic corporation, in other words, in that state, it shall be dissolved if after a proper proceeding in quo, et cetera, et cetera. And if a foreign or non-resident corporation, its right to do business in the state may be declared forfeit. So, I mean, this is how clear these guys were about this. They were absolutely unambiguous. There, historically, there were two categories of, quote, persons in, in common law. And this goes back to seventh century British common law, the, the, the origin of our laws. And, and back during the Heptarchy, the, 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 the Saxon times of, of England, they recognized that there needed to be, in addition to a set of laws that regulated people, a set of laws that regulated institutions. It gave those institutions certain privileges, not rights, but privileges, so that they could be taxed, so that they could own land, so they could sue and be sued, so they could enter into contracts, things like that. And so these two categories historically have been called Per, uh, natural persons, which is you and me, and artificial persons. And everybody got it when the Republic was founded that you know the, all of these things, the Constitution, for example, had to do with natural persons. There was just you know, no ambiguity about that. So in, the, uh, in 1773, after the, after the Civil War was over during Reconstruction, there was a faction within the Republican Party. They actually took over the party after Lincoln was assassinated and uh, took over the, the legislature, they were the ones who uh, impeached Andrew Johnson, called the Radical Republicans. And this was when the Republican Party, keep in mind the Republican Party that started in 1854 was an anti-slavery, what you, today we would call a very progressive party. And it was that way until the 1880s when they became captive of the railroad corporations. And since the 1880s, they've basically been the party of <coughs> what Jefferson referred to as the, uh, the wealthy and the well-born. But you know, prior, there was that little 30-year period where the, where the Republican Party, and particularly the radical Republicans, were the real progressives. And uh, Thaddeus Stevens was probably one of the most outspoken. And uh, he 
helped write the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And the 14th Amendment, even its third clause, even provides that, I mean, he just wanted to punish the, the guys from the Confederacy, that anybody who had been in the Confederacy couldn't even, you know, serve in public office. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it, uh, if you read the 14th Amendment, the third, uh, it's just, it's a real slap. But this is the, 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 the kicker part. This is the really important part here. Because slavery was implicit in the Constitution, the word doesn't exist there, but it was implicit in the Constitution, they realized in order to get it out of the Constitution, they had to amend the Constitution. And so these three amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments were passed, and the 14th Amendment says this, among other things. This is basically how it starts. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Now, so far, it seems like we're talking about human beings, right? No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, semicolon. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, semicolon. Nor deny to any person, now notice it doesn't say natural person, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, period, end of sentence. So that, that was passed in, in 1873. It was ratified by three quarters of the states anyway in 1873. And this strange thing started happening. The, these robber barons had e emerged as a result of the Civil War. During the Civil War, Lincoln was just throwing money at the railroads to get you know, material, war material out to the troops as fast as he could. It was, you know, without the railroads, he, he wouldn't have been able to win the, the, the war. And as a result of this, we had basically five guys who were the robber barons of the day. Um, as, Gould and Huntington, and I, I'm forgetting all their names now, but uh, Harriman, I think, was one of them. In any case, they're, they're, they were names that were well known at that time. And these guys were reaching into the political arena very aggressively and trying, trying to get not just economic power, but political power as well. And the one thing they kept coming up against was all these laws that limited corporate behavior. So there was a series of cases that all originated in the Ninth Circuit in California. It was back in those days, the circuit court judges were all, or the Supreme Court judges also served on the circuit. So there, was, there were nine circuit courts, there were nine judges, justices on the Supreme Court. Each one would ride the circuit for nine months out of the year and then sit in the Supreme Court for three or four months. And Stephen J. Field was the justice in the California, the Ninth Circuit. And we've learned since then, in fact, we've found the letters in his papers in the National Archives, that the railroads were basically bribing him. And that they were telling him, particularly, particularly Huntington and Gould, were telling him that they would support his presidency, his, his uh, hopes for a presidential candidacy in 1888, or 18, 1890, I forget. It would have been 88, 1888 was the election year. Um, if he would just, you know, do this thing. And so, on, there, there, as I recall, there were seven occasions in the Ninth Circuit, five of which made their way to the Supreme Court, where Gould ruled on behalf of the railroads that because a railroad was being taxed one way in one county and another way in another county, that that was unequal protection. That was not equal protection under the law. And that because railroads were persons, albeit artificial, and the 14th Amendment didn't specify only natural persons, clearly, the authors of the 14th Amendment intended to include corporations as well as human beings. And in five cases, Field ruled explicitly in the Ninth Circuit that corporations were persons under the 14th Amendment and that as a consequence of this, if Santa Ana County taxed them in one way and Santa Clara County taxed them in another way, that was the same thing as saying that somebody couldn't sit at the lunch counter because of the color of their skin or something like that. But that was a violation of equal protection of the law. This, uh, four times these cases were, t were lost in the Supreme Court. One in, in uh, one of the early ones, uh, when uh, Justice Harlan uh, was more, a little more outspoken, he actually ridiculed Field, his colleague, for bringing this forward. That was 1882. And finally, in 1886, the fifth case came before the court. It was Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. The railroad hadn't been paying their taxes for a couple of years, two or three years. 
They're refusing to pay the taxes on the, on the fence posts along the rights of way, the basically property tax, because they said that the tax rates were different in Santa Ana County, and they did business in both counties, and they should be taxed under state tax laws rather than county tax laws because the counties were taxing them differently, and this was unequal protection. And, you know, I was writing this book about the history of Jefferson, and I was thinking I, I, I really want to use original source material as much as possible. And I had read all these histories. I'd read, you know, I'd, in fact, during that summer, I had read uh, Charles and Mary Beards. Charles Beard, the Columbia University professor of history. This is 1930, 1929, 1930. They wrote America's Rise to Civilization, or the American Civilization, or Ameri whatever it was. I forget the title, but it was the most prominent, you know, two volume, 680 page history of America up to that point that had ever been written. Charles and Mary Beard. Mary was a, rather famous for her outspoken socialist and feminist activities, and Charles was a world famous historian at Columbia. And in that book, they talked about how in 1886, in, Southern, in, Southern Pacific, in that Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations were persons and entitled equal rights under law. So I assumed that that was the case, having read that. And then I read David Corton's book, When Corporations Rule the World, and David Corton said the same thing. And you know, I mean, pretty much everything I was reading was saying this. And in fact, uh, the year that this book was published, in 2000, first published in 2004, um, I spoke to the Vermont Law School. We had about 300 students and law professors in the room, and I said, how many of you know and this was just, this was not to the public, this was just to the law school. And I said, how many of you know that in 1886, in Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, corporations were given the rights of persons and equal protection under the 14th Amendment, you know, as a result of that case? And every person in the room raised their hands. You know, it's, that was just like common knowledge. Everybody believed that to be the case. But there was, you know, I wanted to be able to actually quote the original document. So I went down to the uh, Vermont Supreme Court and we had this, I just lived eight blocks from it, you know, what the heck. I was living in Montpelier. And <coughs> Vermont has this wonderful old law library, because Vermont was a nation before it joined the United States, and it's just it's this beautiful old law library. And, and uh, went to uh, Paul Donovan, who is the uh, an attorney and librarian for the Supreme Court, the, the, the head librarian and said, Paul, I'm looking for that uh, 1886 case where person, where corporations became people. And he said, oh, you mean Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Road? I said, yeah. Uh, can you show me the original? And he takes me back in these stacks of these old black leather-bound books with a gilt gold printing on them, you know, pu published by Biddle and Banks in New York City in 1889, and pulls out and blows the dust off the top of the actual published Supreme Court records from the, from the you know, the, the, the fall session of 1886. And flips through it and finds the, he says, well, here's the head note and here's where the decision starts. He says, you, know, you start reading here. And so I just sat down and had about four cups of coffee in me. So I could focus <laughs> on my notepad. And it's about a 16 page decision. You, you can read it. In fact, I encourage you to read it. And I'm reading through it and there's all this debate about whether or not the fence posts our, our property or not under California law or whether the county's law, you know, the county's rules should dominate and what's the case. And, and finally, at the very end, the court in issuing its ruling says, uh, you know, and therefore we conclude that uh, because the remedy to this case is found in the Constitution of California, that uh, the, the, the railroads have to pay us. And there's this like paragraph at the very end, I'm paraphrasing this terribly, it's been decades since I read it, but you, you, as I said, you can re look it up yourself and read it. There's a paragraph at the end that says words to the effect of, a constitutional argument was among those several, several arguments presented at court, but because we found the remedy in the state of California's constitution, the court chose not to address the constitutional issue. <laughs> so I'm looking at this going, what the hell? <laughs> so I went back to Paul and I said, Paul, I, you know, I think maybe you gave me the wrong case. And he says, what was it, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Road? I said, yeah. He said, well, it's, I'm pretty sure that's the case. You know, he was a law school graduate and a librarian. And I said, well, come over and take a look at this. And so he comes over to the table, you know, I'm flipping through it, and I said, now read this last paragraph. And he goes, that's weird. And, and 
starts flipping through and he says, uh, let's read the head note. Maybe there's a clue there. And so we flip back to the beginning and the head note opens, essentially. Uh, you know, there's a brief summary of the case. And then, and then, and then the head note says, uh, corporations, I'm paraphrasing again, but basically that's what it said. Corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment and entitled to equal protection under the law. And it actually says that he was quoting Chief Justice Morrison and Emick Waite, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at that time, in saying that. And I said, uh, you know, is the head note no part of the decision? And he said, no, it's not. It has no legal standing. I said, it contradicts the decision. He said, apparently. <laughs> I said, does anybody else know this? <laughs> I, said, I don't know. So I paid my 72 cents and, you know, to make copies of this thing very carefully on the copy machine of the whole decision and walked down the corner and around the street to the office of an attorney who's an old friend of mine, Jim Ritko, and said, you know, Jim, I'd like to talk to you about the Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad 1886 case. He says, oh, you mean the one where corporations gain people? <laughs> <laughs> so I laid him out on his, on his uh, conference table and with a highlighter marked the paragraphs that I just told you about. And I said, read, read this and this and this. And then here's the paragraph at the end of the actual decision. You know? And he goes, well, that's not what I remember from law school. And I said, well, here's probably what you remember. Whip out the head note and you know, say, read this. And he goes, oh, shit. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And, he, and he, said, he said, the head note contradicts the case. And you know, I thought, oh, I've got the key, keys to the kingdom in here. You know, I've had two people now confirm this. <laughs> and and I said, does that mean that we can kind of blow up corporations now? You know, it's, it's, <laughs> and he said, I don't know. He said, you know, you really need to talk to a constitutional lawyer. I'm more, you know, wills and, and property, real estate, and you know, the occasional drunk driving case. You know, <laughs> small town lawyer here. Um, but it, he said, and I said, you know, what is a head note? And he said, a head note is a commentary written by the clerk. He said, back in those days, the clerks actually were paid by the publishing company to write the head notes. That's how they made their living, or how they made an additional income in addition to their salary. On researching this, I found that the clerk of the court was a man by the name of John Chandler Bancroft Davis. He earned $11,000 a year as clerk of the court. At that time, the justices themselves only made $10,000 a year. He was, so he was the full-time staff of the Supreme Court. They're in D.C. all the time. Plus, he was paid by uh, Biddle and Banks, or Banks and Biddle, or whatever the company was that was publishing the book, for writing the head notes. That was the value that he added. And he said, and, and, uh, and he said to me, uh, and in fact, when I was in law school, they taught me, don't ever rely on head notes, because there are sometimes mistakes. And there have, actually, there was a Supreme Court case in 1909 or 1914. Those of you who are law students probably know this better than me. Um, that explicitly ruled that head notes have no legal standing. I mean, this actually became a question before the court one. So, anyhow, he told me to go talk to a constitutional lawyer. I said, who? And he said, well, you know, Deb Markowitz seems to know what's going on with the Constitution. I have a lot of respect for her. She was there, the state attorney general at the time. Now, I didn't know Deb, although we had friends in common, but I'd had her sign up in front of my house when she was running for election the previous year. <laughs> And one of the cool things about living in a state capital that only has 9,700 people in it is that when you call the Secretary of State's office on the phone and the answer on the other end, Secretary of State's office, you say, can I talk to Deb Markowitz? This is she. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said, Deb, you don't know me, but we have friends in common in, in Helen Shelley Cohen. And, um, and I had your sign out in front of my house uh, on <laughs> Northfield Street, you know, right there on the main drag. Now, oh, yeah, I, I know that house. I, thank you. <laughs> and I said, I, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case. And she said, oh, the one where corporations became people. <laughs> And so I read the thing to her, and her response was very similar to Jim's, a little less obscene, but very, very similar. <laughs> and so I said, you know, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that, you know, the, the, she said, well, it means that the court never ruled that corporations are persons. And I said, what does that mean to us now? And she said, well, there have been at least 30 cases, as I recall, and it turns out that I think there's 34 now, that have quoted the headnote, the language in the headnote. And she said, the Supreme Court can quote Donald Duck. 
it doesn't matter. You know, their sources. If they quote Donald Duck and saying, you know, that uh, in his relationship with Daisy, this is, you know, and therefore such and such is legal now, that becomes the law of the land. You know, in, in part, this goes back to Marbury versus Madison, which is a whole other wonderful rant, but we don't have time for it tonight, although it's in the book. Um, and so she said, what this means is that the 1886 case wasn't precedent, but the first case that quoted it became the precedent, which it turns out was about seven or eight years later. So, I, you know, I didn't have the keys to the kingdom, but I thought I did. Now, here's where it gets really ironic. So, arguably in 1886, corporations were given the rights of persons. What else was going on at that point in time? In April of, of uh, I'm sorry, wrong one. Where did it go? In November of 1872, Susan B. Anthony went and voted. Bad idea, at least at the time. Actually, I'd say it's a good idea in history, you know, historically, but or actually it was on November 12th. No, it was November 1st that she voted. On November 12th, she wrote a letter saying, all persons are citizens, no state shall deny or abridge the citizen's rights. Two days later, she was arrested and charged with voting while female, which was a crime. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have the money to take her case to the Supreme Court, although it was her intention to. You go back and read her, her letters. But another woman had, whose name was Bradwell, and in 1873, the Supreme Court in Bradwell versus the state of Illinois, another case where a woman had gone in and voted and been arrested for voting while female, uh, ruled specifically, now keep in mind, this is, this is about the time that the same court is giving rights of personhood to corporations. The same court ruled, quote, this is from Bradwell, from the decision, the family institution is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. So firmly fixed was this sentiment in the founders of the common law that it became a maxim of that system of jurisprudence that a woman has no legal existence separate from her husband who is regarded as her head and sole representative in the social state." End quote. Talk about an activist court. But, you know. So, you know, then about 10 years later, uh, this fellow by the name of, um, I'm forgetting his first name, Ferguson, Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson, Ferguson was the guy who got thrown off the train, right, or got arrested on the train, Plessy was the railroad cop, as I recall, maybe it was the other way, maybe that's the way it was, okay, and, and um, you know, he was arrested for walking into the white car in the, on the railroad when he was supposed to stay in the, in the, in the car for African Americans. Plessy versus Ferguson goes before the court. And in that case, John Chandler Bancroft Davis, the court reporter, who wrote the head note in the Santa Clara case, writes in the head note of Plessy versus Ferguson, Plessy, being a passenger between two, two stations within the state of Louisiana, was assigned by the officers of the railroad company to a coach used for the race to which he belonged, but he insisted upon going into a coach uh, used by the race to which he did not belong. Davis then quotes the 14th Amendment, and then says, the object of this amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. So the court says, corporations, yeah, they're persons, they got rights, equal protection under the law, African American, no, nah. women, no. Nah. And I mean, this is, this is it's, it's like falling through Alice's looking glass. So, you know, looking, digging into this, what I found, uh, and, and I also discovered, by the way, that I wasn't the first one to find this, that this had been published in the Vanderbilt Law Review in 1964 in an obscure article that apparently nobody ever read because I could not, in, until I was three quarters of the way through writing this book, I, n nobody brought it to my attention, I couldn't find anyone, um, that, there were, th there was a correspondence between Justice Waite and John Chandler Bancroft Davis, the clerk of the court, in which the clerk of the court, and it's on my website, and it's gonna be in the next edition of the book, we're actually gonna holographically re you know, reprint the actual handwritten note, and the, the text of it's in this book. Um, the clerk of the court says, uh, did I understand you correctly to say that, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing here, that you know, corporations are persons on the 14th Amendment. And Waite writes back to him saying, um, 
I'm not sure exactly what I said, but it doesn't really matter because we didn't address the constitutional issue. But David, so then I'm like, okay, so who the hell is this guy Davis who just gave all this power to corporations in the head note in conspiracy, it turned out, with Stephen Field, who was also in the Supreme Court, and, and Davis's friend. Who is this guy Davis? So I go looking off on him, and I found in, in upstate New York, in, the, in I forget which county, that he was one of the original incorporators and for two years was the president of the New Bergen, New York Railroad. <laughs> His father was, the, was the, the former governor of Massachusetts. He came from a wealthy and powerful family. He was connected to the railroad families. You know, it was all, this was like the, the aristocracy. So to bring this to, I'm, I'm gonna try and wrap this up in the next five, 10 minutes here, so give you time for uh, questions. Um, to bring this to today. We've had now a series of decisions that have been rooted in this case. Uh, that have looked back at, at uh, Santa Clara County and, and given corporations increasingly more and more rights uh, on the assumption that the Supreme Court had ruled that they are persons. No federal legislature, the House, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate has never ruled corporation should have the rights of persons. No president have, has ever asserted that or written to that effect. In fact, Grover Cleveland, in, in, 18, in his uh, address to Congress, his annual State of the Union address, four times addressed this issue. He said the people feel that they are trampled under the iron heel of the modern corporation. I mean, he, he, he was just going head on against the Supreme Court, <coughs> much like our current president the current court. And, and that's a whole fascinating history. So this is law entirely made by the Supreme Court. A Supreme Court that you could argue was never given that power in the Constitution. The Constitution does not say that the Supreme Court has the power to overturn laws passed by the legislature or confer these kinds of rights uh, to artificial beings. It simply says it's the, it's the Supreme Court of the land. That's all, it'll be the final arbiter. And as, as those of you who are law students know, it was in 1803 that the court took that power to itself in the Marbury versus Madison case. Um, and uh, the uh, Chief Justice John Marshall at that time, who was a second cousin of Thomas Jefferson and his most ardent political enemy, uh, ruled in that case. And, and, and Jefferson just went nuts, in fact. Um, in fact, I just, this is just one other thing to share with you and then I'll get right, right back to the point. Because I just, I just, I find all this stuff so, so uh, this kind of anecdotal stuff so, so relevant actually. In 1803, the week after the decision, Marbury versus Madison. In this case, um, Justice Chief Justice Marshall ruled that the Supreme Court had the power to overturn a law passed by Congress and signed by the President, based on its own interpretation of what the meaning of the Constitution. Was. Again, a power not given to the court by the, by the Constitution. And the President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, was elected in 1800, this is 1803. President of the United States wrote to uh, Patrick Henry's son-in-law, Spencer Rowan, who was uh, the judge of the Virginia Supreme Court and one of Jefferson's best friends. He didn't like Patrick Henry, by the way. Patrick Henry, <coughs> liberty or give me death, was a hardcore fundamentalist Christian, and he and Jefferson just like, but anyway, he liked to sign. He says, if this opinion be sound, Jefferson wrote, then indeed is our Constitution a complete fellow de se, which is Latin for legally a suicide, a pact of suicide, for intending to establish three departments, coordinate and independent, that they might check and balance one another, it has given, according to this opinion, to one of them alone, the right to prescribe rules for the government of the others, and that one too, which is unelected by and independent of the people of the nation. And then he continues in full rant. The Constitution on this hypothesis is a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, which they may twist and shape into any form they please. It should be remembered as an axiom of eternal truth in politics, that whenever power in any government is independent, it is also absolute. In theory only at first, while the spirit of the people is up, but in practice as fast as that relaxes. Independence can be trusted nowhere but with the people in mass. They are inherently independent of all but moral law. 
my construction of the Constitution is very different from that you quote. Because the, the letter uh, Rowan had sent him a copy of the Marbury decision. He said it is that each department is truly independent of the others and has an equal right to decide for itself what is the meaning of the Constitution in the cases submitted to its action, and especially where it is to act ultimately and without, a, and a, and without appeal. A Supreme Court independent of a king or executive alone is a good thing, but independent of the will of the nation is a solecism. If I pronounce that word right, uh, it means blunder. And uh, at least in a, in a Republican form of government. So, but because the Supreme Court has that power, the, really the only way to now to directly address it, the only way to challenge the Supreme Court is to actually change the Constitution, is to amend the Constitution. So that, in my opinion, that's, that's the thing, that's the next step that we have to take, that there is, no, there is no legislative remedy. We might be able to nibble around the edges legislatively. We could do public financing of campaigns. It might help out, it will help. Uh, but it's not, I mean, you know, consider, the total amount of money spent by John McCain and Barack Obama combined in the last election, combined, was about $1.6 billion. Wellpoint, one health insurance company, in the last quarter, the last three months, showed a $2.9 billion profit. If they just took half of that profit, they'd have more money, and, and, just, and they could drop it in, in a three-week period on 70 or 80 or 100 congressional races and, and 20 senatorial races, and only a third of the Senate is up for, for re-election. There's only 33 senators up for re-election. And just, you know, boom! And that's just one company. Think of what, a, what would happen if, if 100 companies got together and each said, yeah, we'll kick in 1% of our corporate profits. By the way, it's tax deductible. <laughs> so I believe that the Citizens United case, particularly as people in the 2010 and 2012 elections start seeing the consequences of it, and hopefully they will. Part of the problem is that the corporations that filter all our news are also going to be dropping money. And so they're probably not going to be talking about all the money that gets dropped, which means that it's up to us to spread the word. And I, I just want to encourage you to be part of that and say that it's not, you know, every real significant change in the history of this country has come about as a result of citizens' movements. It's never come from the political structure. It's always come from the people. Margaret Mead was right. And therefore, tag, your it. <laughs>